Good afternoon. My name is Patrick Plews. I'm Vice President for State Government Affairs for the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Welcome to Bio 2016. I'm here today to kick off the session on value-based uh, pricing, um, but I'd like to introduce a very special guest of ours today, Assemblyman Kevin Mullen. Kevin Mullen uh, knows this industry very well. He represents the heart of the industry in San Mateo County, South San Francisco, and he's the co-chair of the Select Committee on Biotechnology in the California Assembly. We are very pleased that he did well yesterday in his primary, so we will see him in Sacramento for a few more years. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce Assemblyman Kevin Mullen. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to day three of BIOS International Convention. My name is Kevin Mullen. I'm the Speaker Pro Tem of the California State Assembly. More importantly, for the purposes of our session, I am Chairman of the Select Committee on Biotechnology in the Lower House of the Legislature. I want to take a quick moment to thank Brian O'Connor, Jimmy Jackson, and Eve Bukowski for inviting me to say a few words today. Associations like Biocom, Bio, and the California Life Sciences Association help my colleagues in Sacramento learn more about all the incredible work that is happening in the biotechnology field and all that your companies are doing for our communities and our state as a whole. And to you all, some of you may be from California, but for those who are not, welcome to San Francisco. I hope you are all experiencing everything this city has to offer. It's great to see this convention come back to the birthplace of biotechnology. The Select Committees on Biotechnology is comprised of assembly members who represent biotechnology hubs across the state from San Diego to my hometown of South San Francisco. The informational hearings we have on medical devices, workforce development, and manufacturing policy help paint a picture of the impact biotech has on the state of California. The public policy we create in the legislature is key to fostering the success of biotechnology in the state, from tax credits to helping students gain access to community colleges or making higher education more affordable. Uh, to build that workforce pipeline, which is so critical in, it, in the industry. These are all public policies that we put in place to keep our innovation economy thriving here in California. The speakers you're about to hear from have all been at the forefront of new technology, business models, and adapting to the needs of consumers everywhere. And I look forward to the exciting information they are going to share with all of you. And with that, I want to welcome you all to California. Hope you enjoy your remaining time here at Bio 2016. And with that, very pleased to turn it over to Anna Reardon. Thank you all very much. We are facing seismic shifts in the fundamental forces driving the healthcare industry. Social economic changes, scientific breakthroughs, and digital and technological advances are converging to create a catalytic moment of change. The healthcare industry is being disrupted. New business models and strategies are emerging, and companies are stepping up to take their place in the new landscape. In the coming years, we have an unprecedented opportunity to dramatically improve patient care around the world. New targeted therapeutics, smart diagnostics, Advanced informatics and digital technologies promise to redefine healthcare as the proactive management of health versus the largely reactive state it's in today with strong dependencies on acute interventions and physical care centers. And in 10 to 15 years, it will function fundamentally differently than it does today. Value, defined anew, will increasingly be the metric that matters as healthcare pivots back to the patient in extraordinarily new and different ways. In fact, the disruptions are already underway. As we speak, we are seeing the outlines of new performance and value-focused business and operating models. We wrote this book to recognize this catalytic moment and to predict and discuss the four fundamental business models we see emerging in this new era. Like everything in life, there are shades of gray. The models represent direction, choices, and strategies. The implementation in each environment will depend on the journey where companies have come from, and what place they want to hold in the future. However, with a more comprehensive grasp of the fast-changing health ecosystem and a deeper understanding of the new capabilities needed to excel within it, 
We believe that life sciences companies will be able to transform their businesses to become leaders of a new era in healthcare and vastly improve an ecosystem that is only just beginning to take shape. In doing so, they will set the foundations of healthcare. And as these foundations solidify, they will become the vanguard on which all other aspects of the industry will build. Well, hello there. It's always strange to see yourself up on a big screen like that. Um, I'm Anna Reardon. I am the Global Senior Managing Director in charge of Accenture's Life Sciences Practice. Thrilled to be here today. Um, Jeff and I uh, uh, are here uh, with the book that we created on healthcare disruption. And we're also here with fabulous panelists, which I think we're going to have a very lively debate given uh, our pre-conversations, just on how can we and what are the, how will we move towards the more value-driven, uh, patient-centered biopharma of the future. So uh, what I'm going to do first is hand over to Jeff. And Jeff is going to introduce um, a couple of slides. Um, and we'll come back and introduce you to our panelists afterwards. And then I will facilitate a discussion. We would love you guys to participate. Uh, we do have questions uh, up front, but I'm going to try and set aside some time. So as you're listening and thinking about this, please do um, think about your questions. And we'd, we'd love to take them as we go through. So Jeff, over to you. Great. Thank you, Anne. So just for the record, our video was filmed in California. Those were the uh, Redwoods city of salt flats, I think, in the background. So uh, we did try to produce locally. Um, let me, I want to go through a bit of a overview of what we covered actually in the book and a, and a bit of why we actually did the book all together. So about two, two and a half years ago, we actually started tracking different aspects of healthcare reforms around the world. We obviously were paying attention to ACA and the reforms going into place in the United States. We spent time going through the European health systems. And in fact, oftentimes we were having direct interaction with uh, whether it was regulator health authorities, uh, different provider systems, et cetera, that we were kind of trying to bring together. And part of what was coming from that was a pretty wholesale change in terms of how healthcare was actually going to be paid for, managed, et cetera. And we actually saw a convergence of those same themes occurring across all geographies. Uh, just as a side note, we're actually doing now a more Asian-focused version where we're actually going to focus on that, which will actually be uh, coming forward later in the year. But part of this actually was the fact that outcomes and some risk or performance basis was moving into provider systems in slightly different models kind of throughout the world. And that that was actually fundamentally changing even the structure of what healthcare delivery systems were changes, how they manage things, kind of et cetera. Oftentimes, we were even finding healthcare provider systems changing their language. Some actually in the United States were becoming larger, had their own health plans, were beginning to use the word consumer because they were responsible for population outcomes over a longer period of time. And it wasn't about actually a health intervention for a health failure. It actually was as much about kind of building health uh, into the individuals. That change combined with the fact that now we actually had data and that data, whether it was derived from EMRs, wearable, or other devices, actually allowed us to measure things that historically weren't really measurable with confidence. Not that all the data are of incredible quality, but they were actually improving and they were actually beginning to be put into use uh, by certain risk-bearing systems, payers, et cetera, and they were becoming increasingly more accessible to life sciences companies as part of their decision-making and having some knowledge and understanding of what was going on. The third part was actually the power of some digital tools. And here we were actually seeing digital tools complementing therapeutics and actually capable of achieving outcomes on par with chemical, some chemical and biological entities in certain areas. So when we combined these, we actually kind of came to the conclusion, these are, these are major changes. These are things that can actually operate at population scale, national scale, and they're actually going to demand actually a, a change and they offer up the opportunity for some fundamental changes in operating models. This conference, and I'm sure you've had a variant of, as you've kind of gone through the last three days of this notion from volume to, to value, but this is, uh, if, if volume is around financial performance, scale, market share, size, et cetera, 
value is actually around understanding a patient and a patient set of goals, but it's also about understanding a provider system or a risk bearer's view of outcomes that actually may open up effective capacity in the system or actually help them more effectively manage to certain goals. Most of this actually then ultimately gets centered around data and information that's going to be available, but oftentimes it's also requiring very different models about where activities are going. If you actually, we did a survey recently, and if you asked large health provider systems, particularly those with venture funds and then some of their own private equity funds, and if you ask some of the largest payers, where are they expending more of their resources? Much of that's going into areas where they say remote patient monitoring, minimizing the actual facilities-based infrastructure investments they're doing, and actually having a greater ability to manage patient populations in a variety of remote home, work, and other kind of settings. And this is actually what they've said. This is where they're placing their dollars, their investment. So this notion of where we're operating and where we're actually delivering what we thought was care or actually achieving an outcome is actually fundamentally shifting. The, the, the next part of this was also that who we have to interact with was also shifting, whereas historically this was individual information to prescribers or an individual clinical decision maker, and that might even be part of the, the industry's commercial model. It's actually now almost moving more to being a team sport in providing a solution, but it actually is integrated decision making that's actually a lot more complicated. It actually involves actually much, so it's almost more of a business to business style process that we saw emerging that actually requires much greater depth and expertise to kind of be deployed. So part of this then, and this is where we spent the bulk of our kind of research in the book coming out is how an individual organization or company chooses to participate actually requires making some explicit decisions. Some of those decisions around how are they positioned, how are they going to actually deliver, what, what value is going to be. And actually right now, value doesn't have a common definition, so there is a lot of latitude to shape up some of what those expectations are. What capabilities do they have and what capabilities come together through partnerships they're putting together to kind of do that? And fundamentally, at the end of the day, there's a redefinition of what it means to have a high-performing, high-performance enterprise that can't just be dependent upon one company's capabilities. The book itself, and again, you can, uh, you've got it, I think, in your seats, et cetera, outlines sort of four meta categories that we saw emerging of strategies and that were coming together. One, we termed the lean innovator. These were companies that were once uh, generics companies built on the chassis of generics, but when you actually look at them, and I could uh, pick a company like a, a Teva, et cetera, they have enormous scale, so they can cover 85% of all prescribed therapeutics or indications. Uh, in the United States, you know, one out of every four or five uh, medicines actually taken each day come from one company. So there's sort of enormous scale, but actually their model's changing such that they're actually integrating analytics and devices and technologies and other infrastructure, but within a cost structure of a model that still looks a little bit more like the, the generics companies. We saw this emerging as its own kind of uh, own version of an operating model. The second one was one we call the value innovators. Most of these today are device companies, but they have actually made a transition from being product-centric to actually being service-centric. And so if you look at Medtronic and if you look at some other companies, they're actually going through a wholesale process of actually assuring outcomes in a services model of which product becomes a component of the answer. But the economic model is a service-centric model. And in fact, they're actually training even analyst communities and investors about how to think about the transformation in their own financial structure around that. The third category, which is a large part of who we have probably here in this conference at BIO here today, are the around the patient innovators. These are very deep science-centric companies that actually recognize high on medical needs, but through really distinctive science and path-breaking research provide a solution but increasingly getting that solution to the market and getting the market to recognize the value that's there requires adding complementary capabilities, whether it's called digital medicines or other kind of capabilities that actually assure more of an outcome than just the biological or chemical entity alone may be capable of doing. And then finally, uh, we have a category called the new health digitals, which are a combination of 
companies that had been in healthcare for a long time, like a Philips that are now shedding everything that is not healthcare, and newer organizations and companies who basically say that digital approaches are capable of contributing to achieving significant outcomes for patients and adding significant value within the healthcare system. And we saw these as things that, as companies that could stand on their own and actually integrate and partner across the other three categories. So this is this where, kind of where we spend a lot of our time. So I'm gonna pause on that. We actually are gonna dive into a lot more around value and the components as we kind of go through the panel, but let me hand back over to Ann. Great, thanks Jeff. Um, now first things first, actually, I want uh, to go back and have the panel introduce themselves uh, properly. Um, and then just, just so you know how this will flow, we have some questions, we'll go through them. Uh, we'll open the floor to you guys. Um, we did give you the book, and uh, Jeff and I will be around afterwards. We're happy to sign the book if you so wish, so we'll do that at the back of the room. But this panel is fabulous, so let me, Mike, do you want to go first and just introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Mike Nohaley. I'm Vice President of Strategy and Innovation at Amgen, and we're looking at every place that the newer technologies can disrupt and improve healthcare. That goes from virtual trials and how we do them more effectively and efficiently and do R&D better, all the way through to devices and how they become more connected, how you generate real world data and how you use that to show value, to drive value uh, throughout the healthcare system. Okay, I'm John Glasswell, Executive Vice President at Baxalta, now part of Shire. With the merger with Shire, we became the world's largest rare disease company. And, you know, our journey in this innovation space is really driven by the needs of patients with rare and orphan diseases. So it's very much deep into the patient journey and making sure within that journey we understand how the technologies we can bring to bear are going to help that patient normalize their life, ensure they get the treatment they deserve, and ensure that they're, they understand the value of their medication and make sure that it's easy for them to take in a way that enables and empowers them as individuals and makes them feel less like a patient. Great. I'm definitely the odd man out. My company's revenue is probably a rounding error <laughs> of these two companies, but uh, my name is Doug Bean. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of AliveCore. Uh, we're a digital health company that is really focused on um, you know, heart disease, the number one killer in the world. And our solution is the uh, world's leading uh, FDA cleared medical grade smartphone EKG. And so uh, we have FDA clearance on our device and algorithms that help patients and cardiologists across the world uh, early detect atrial fibrillation, which is a leading cause of stroke, and get them on a care pathway to live a long, healthy life and save their lives and give them unprecedented peace of mind. So I'm excited to be here. Yours is the sexiest company, Doug. That's what I was <laughs> no question. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so just leading off in a general question here, um, what trends and forces uh, do you believe uh, does pharma and biotech need to respond to? And Jeff touched on them a little bit, but just curious on your opinion. Mike, do you want to lead on this? Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of forces. I think the two biggest are obviously we have healthcare systems uh, and, and, and physicians and patients that are searching for increased value, right? I, I, maybe you're all satisfied with the therapies that are out there. I'm not. I can think of almost no areas where the therapies and how they're applied are sufficient to the task. Right, even in places where we have therapies that generally can control chronic disease, if I take that as a case, often they're not used or they're not used compliantly and the patient doesn't derive the benefit. So I think there's a real demand given the financial pressures and everything for that value to come. At the same time, I think it's pretty obvious that you know, the world's been disrupted by digital um, and there are very few places that haven't been and healthcare is one of the last holdout where I think we're at the beginning of the wave and if we don't, you know, we can either be on that wave or we can get run over by the wave. And, and you know, we're trying to be on the wave to, to try to serve the value. Yeah. I would just pick up on that. I think one of the opportunities is really to go beyond the pill and really differentiate an entire solution to really get more involved in the prevention of a bad thing happening and really engage that consumer and clinician in that, in that de early detection phase and then using technology and therapies to uh, better manage and better um, uh, take care of patients uh, in a more uh, long-term way. 
Yeah, I, I would build off both of those things. I think the two areas that, you know, to me, leverage off those, one, one is the need to demonstrate value, and it requires new technologies, new interventions to really, I think, maximize the value. And the second element is really patient empowerment, and patient empowerment driven by access to data, but also the fact that patients continue to pick up a greater and greater burden in terms of the cost of their care and the impact on them and their family. So I think the combination of those three things is really what, as an industry, we need to respond to. And we were talking about this at lunch, um, getting to know each other. And I think there's, this, there's a debate on patient empowerment or patient engagement. It's kind of one of those uh, sweeping assertions that's made across the industry. And I think you know, you got to make sure that when you think about patient engagement, it's not um, you know, a simple solution. you got to really use more of a design thinking approach to understand how can you make your uh, care plans, uh, the, the, the processes, the tools, it's so convenient. I mean, consumers don't change their standards when they engage with, um, you know, Instagram versus healthcare. They want the healthcare experience to be as easy and convenient as it is making a post or responding to your, your friends. And so using technology, using information in, in a way that people could actually understand and stop using professional language, but start using language that consumers can understand, easy, convenient access to tools and affordability are really what's going to help true patient empowerment and engagement, I think. And I was sort of the outlier on this because we just started discussing patient Not for the first time, by the way. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, we've, we worked together a long time ago. Um, the... Uh, and, and I have a, not a negative reaction to patient centricity, but it always raises a slight concern in my mind. And the concern is that we can't put all the burden on the patients, right? This idea that you see, that I see sometimes in the press that, you know, they're just going to get their whole genome sequence and they're just going to look at it and then they're going to do the right thing. I, that, that is not a fair burden to put on the average patient who's dealing with the emotional distress of having a disease, doesn't really understand the biology and why should they, et cetera. So I think while the patient is always at the center, there's a lot of design thinking. How do we enable the physician to really help the patient? How do we make it easy for the patient to do it? You know, they're not going to sit there and interpret the EKG, right? But how do we make it so that they get positive feedback on using it in a way that's really empowering, while at the same time in no way saying, hey, it's all your problem. You figure it out. And if you don't want to take the time to do all the work, yeah. too bad. Yeah. Um, so I just think we have to be careful about how we talk about it and be really clear that it, it involves the entire healthcare system in order to make sure that the patient actually gets the outcome that we're looking yeah. for. Yeah, I, I, you know, I agree that it, isn't, it can't be about patient burden. Right? It, in the same way many of you would have downloaded an app or decided you're going to start a new diet or a new fitness re regime, if you can't fit it into your daily life in a very simple, easy fashion, mm -hmm. it's too easy to drop off. And I think that's the same with health. And we can't suddenly say, because somebody gets a certain diagnosis, well, they're going to be willing to take on all this extra workload. What I do think about patient centricity is we need to understand what that burden is. We need to, to use all of the tools at our disposal to, to, to help them manage that burden. And I'm building on Doug's point, there's no reason we can't understand the language they use. In today's world with social media and other things, we can literally use the same wording that they're using to communicate about that burden on their journey that they can actually be reflected back to. And what we need to be very careful of is taking our medicalized clinical language and then going to communicate that to the patient as if the 1% of their life they understand as well as the 100% of our life. One of the design criteria that I, um, I hear all the time when you think about designing for the patient or how to build stronger patient relationships is also the uh, reciprocal burden put on the physician. I mean, there are less physicians for the demand in which is being demanded upon them, especially with the aging population, especially in cardiology in our space. So when you design these types of uh, strategies, you also got to think about the velocity and the impact of the velocity on your practices or your health systems. Because if any solution you put in the market is going to put a greater burden on that ability to, to take care of patients and their, their, their velocity within their clinical settings, it will fail. Yeah. So, it, again, to your point, it's just, you know. And it's only getting worse, right? Yeah. The average doctor might have had to know, I don't know how many facts, 10 years ago, but just take cancer, right? 
Um, it's hard enough to get your head around KRAS as a negative selective marker for an EGFR. But okay, now there's going to be hundreds of those, thousands of those. Yeah. There's going to be getting new information. What does, what does an EKG that a patient takes regularly on a regular basis mean versus the one time they come in my office? That's right. We're going to have to help that physician have some way to, to sort through that and then engage the patient That's right. appropriately. So there's a lot more design than just what does the patient do. Yeah. And I guess I, get, I just get worried sometimes that we talk about it like, hey, we'll throw it at the patient, they'll have an app, and it'll be fine. Yeah, I, I think this is where though technology can help as well as hinder, because I think you know we as as people move away from paper-based, clinical ind independent review, yep. looking at different tests from different labs at the same time, the fact that then data can be amalgamated, the fact that the patient can own the data, the fact that EMR becomes more and more standardised, the fact that people don't just record what the test is, but why the test was done and what the result of the test means. As technology can move to enable that, that should remove some of that burden. But the key is think, keeping that in mind as we put it in place. Yeah. Awesome. Well, they did kind of, uh, <laughs> you, did, you did touch on what patient-centric meant uh, in the digital and value-centric age. But what I'd like to get from you guys is, you know, within your company models, uh, what do you think has to change? How does this challenge our existing and historical business models and ways of working in R&D and in technology and in commercial all across the board? Um, yeah, John? Maybe I could take a step back and just say, because you know, Mike and I had a very lively debate over lunch, not for the first time in history, but um, about patient centricity. The way I think about patient centricity, recognizing it cannot be a burden, is we have to be in a position to really marry the, the burden of the disease versus the standard of care and the biology which you're all engaged in developing. And it can't be either or. We have to marry those two things to, together. So for me, it's understand the burden, understand the burden versus the standard of care, and then make sure as we go to develop a clinical development plan, we understand the patient journey. We understand where are their challenges, remembering that they're leading the same lives that we all lead. They have the stress of their child going to school or their kid going to college or all these other things. How do we understand the journey? How do we understand the disease that impacts that? And how do we help with our drugs, with our technologies to really make sure that we minimize that? And I think if we accept that it's about understanding their burden, how do we make it easier? That to me radically changes everything we think about. It starts with, are we really cataloging their burden? Do we understand from a patient reported outcome perspective what their big challenges are? Not necessarily what the medical dictionary says it is. What do they really experience? Can we capture that in patient reported outcomes in the language that they would reflect on? Can we develop that into a scale that people will accept as a, a rational measure when we come to demonstrate value to pay, payers later on? And then building in as we think through how we're going to demonstrate that, what things can be answered in classic placebo-controlled trials? What things can we prospectively build into real-world evidence plans and be very thoughtful about that? So when we come to the end of that value chain and seek to get reimbursement, we're in the best position to make sure the patient gets access to what they need, people understand what the treatment's doing for them, and ultimately the healthcare system, the company, and the patient win. I'd say I think, you know, I think if you look at all the different uh, players in the healthcare system. I think everybody's kicking the tires on value and, and digital. I don't think everybody's figured it out. Well, I know we're going to talk later about you know, where we are in the maturity level, but we're all in early stages. But I do know some things that go real wrong, like in our space, I mean, there are like, what, 50, 60,000 different healthcare apps out there. And I think to me, one of the biggest mistakes is lack of context. There are a lot of um, like, uh, people coming from different industries that have no context of healthcare saying we're going to just disrupt healthcare those will largely fail because they're missing that context. You really have to understand the complexities of the different stakeholders, different value exchange within healthcare to really then just design those disruptive solutions. Um, and I'm finding just having that context and then whether it was big companies and small companies or small companies that have a, what I call a cocktail of people coming from healthcare and other spaces, I think you come up with some really interesting ideas. But I also think it all always comes down to what they call it evidence or yeah. or outcomes or um, you know data. But mm -hmm. you you got to be um, striving for clinical outcomes um, that are meaningful uh, right. and at significantly less cost or or much more efficient. And there are just so many um, um, fakes out there. You got to be really careful. I mean, having the 
uh, the evidence to, to make those kind of claims, I think is super important. So being really focused on the outcomes, having that context, I think are super important to, 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 to overcome these challenges. Yeah, I think for us, you know, it, it's a challenge, right? I mean, you're asking a, a company that's works on a, you know, 10, 15 year <laughs> life cycle to suddenly engage in digital. And we work with our colleagues at digital companies, they're like, well, well, we'll do this in like next week. We're going to yeah. do a minimally viable product and we're going to launch it and we're going to A-B test it. And you're like, yeah, I love that. Uh, but we're in a slightly different space. It takes a little bit longer to do things. At the same time, sometimes we make things take too long, right? We're, mm -hmm. right? So marrying those two cultures is something that we're working on and trying to get people that understand both sides and really understand the regulatory and ethical and other things we really have to respect while at the same time not using those as a shield to move slowly. That's one thing. I think secondly, we are working on how do we get our teams, you know, developing a drug from scratch is one of the most complicated things I think people do. Um, you know, the, the, just the interplay of all the factors. And now, you know, I go to them and I say, oh, by the way, really think hard about these technologies early. And it comes back to something that the, both, both of my co-panelists said, which is they now just don't have to ask, well, what's the FDA going to ask? They have to understand, well, how the patient's going to use this? What's their real journey? What is their life? How's the physician going to interact? What's the system going to think? How are we going to not only show that this is a safe and effective therapy to the regulators, but this is a valuable therapy and, and prove it to patients, physicians, systems, payers, Right, that's a lot more to take on, yeah. and so we're spending a lot of time, you know, rethinking how the teams work, making sure the expertise is there, trying to force them to get out in the world more and interact with with people. So it's a big change for us, but I don't see any other way to get to the kinds of answers that we yeah. seem to need. I, I think you know, Mike's really highlighted what is one of the biggest disruptions that the great classical world we had of we discovered in the lab, we run the phase one, we run the phase two, we develop. We get alignment with the FDA and we do the phase three and boom, we have the great product and we sell it to a whole host of individuals with that disease. That's already very challenging. Once you layer on top all of that, the vignette of how it's going to be used, what's going to keep people adherent, how do we make sure they capture the outcomes, how do we make sure the physician is thinking through the particular patient with the particular outcome and capturing that to feed that value into the ERM and make sure the payer understands they didn't just pay for an input but they paid for an output and make sure those things are all tied together, the, the disruption of our industry has just become even more complicated. Absolutely. Um, um, so just switching gears a little bit, um, just to the, the whole concept of the bigger picture on the system, how can you know, <coughs> value really be brought to the broader system, the providers, the risk bearers? Uh, while we continue to do what we're good at, right, in this industry, which is really focus on the unmet needs of the patients. Um, I don't know, John, do you, or is it Doug wants to I start could, on this? Yeah, I can start. I think, there are, I think there are four things that really deliver value. Um, I guess you could, you, could, you could twist that based on which stakeholder you're talking about. We typically think of value either from a health system, cardiologist perspective, or a patient. But at a system level, I think there are four things. It's all around clinical outcomes. How could you uh, do a better job at early detection? How could you do a better job of, of managing the, the patient's uh, clinical outcomes? I mean, that I mean, is like usually number one. I think that's the one thing that's most common talk about. Um, the other thing is what I talked about earlier around capacity. I mean, every single um, health system, health organization is really uh, uh, suffering from scarcity of time and resources for the burden of the demand, whether it's more access through the exchanges that people are accessing the care system, or whether it's the aging population, uh, or the sicker population, um, th there's just such a huge burden. So I mean, I think clinical outcomes and en enabling um, um, uh, the capacity within uh, your, your your health systems, your clinical settings. The other that they don't want to talk about is is the incentives. I mean, every time you go into a into a, a conversation, a focus group, research study. Clinicians, providers, health systems never really want to talk about money or the rewards, but you got to get those right. Mm -hmm. uh, it may not be a CPT code as far as in a value-based model, but how do you structure those, those, those ways in which to incentive the right behaviors to shift from a fee-for-service model into more of a value orientation? And the last, and it, I mean, what's interesting, I come from a marketing background, and over the last five years, I think 
I have never seen so many health systems spend millions and millions of dollars on billboards on TV commercials ever. I mean, because they value the relationships with their patients. They not only want to acquire them, they want to retain them. They want to build those bonds or those relationships. And so I think truly trying to find a, a, a way to, not necessarily patient engagement, but it's really around relationships. How can you deliver a stronger value proposition throughout your life, not just in those office visits, because those are going away, uh, that build those lasting relationships. So clinical outcomes, capacity within the, uh, the workflow, um, the right incentives, and patient relationships. I think those are the four things that really drive um, value. Yeah, Doug, Doug, maybe from, the, from our lunch, do, can you share the example of AF and what went on there? Because I think that prevention piece yeah, so, is really amazing. So atrial fibrillation is the leading cause of stroke. And about among the you know, 65 plus population, you know, 9% of that population has AF. Uh, if you have AF, you have a five times more likely chance of a stroke. Strokes aren't good, and strokes are very costly, about 140000 for all-in cost for a stroke incident. So it's, it's very expensive to the system, it's very expensive to the patient. We deployed a technology that's extremely affordable, you can get it on Amazon right now, uh, with a leading healthcare system, which I won't name names, but it's, everybody knows who they are. And they deployed this technology across every, city, every single setting of care, whether it's be an ER, a GP, a cardiologist, an OB, a pediatric. Uh, and they used our technology as a, as a vital sign, just taking your weight or taking your temperature, taking your EKG, it's now possible. You don't have to take your shirt off and put 12 things all over your body. Um, Good. Well, lo and behold, we identified 2.8% <laughs> of their population to have atrial fibrillation, unpreviously diagnosed, and now which all those thousands of patients that did have any clue that AF was even an issue, they have it, and now they're on a treatment plan, and their risk of stroke goes down by you know 60 to 80 percent, and uh, obviously the peace of mind that they have, and of course this entity who manages that risk of that population mm -hmm. are definitely delivering value in spades. So those kinds of things could happen Absolutely. with the proper use of technology. No, that's yeah. great. And those are areas you know that, that we're looking at very hard, which is how do you identify patients early? And by the way, that will have big implications for us in the long run because we may have to develop our drugs differently. Yeah. If we really believe in the future, patients will be identified earlier. You would want to do different studies to make sure that you cover those populations in ways today you may say, well, we'll wait for the stage three, four of disease A, B, C. Hey, maybe in the future we're gonna see a lot of stage one, two patients, which is better for the patients, and then we need to generate the evidence and really understand what's the best use of the therapy in that population. Um, so that's the kind of stuff you're trying to gaze into a crystal ball and even try to help happen, right? So, you know, uh, you, you look and you see where healthcare is going and you think, well, doctors are going to have a lot more support. The screen's gonna give them a lot of information about what they should and shouldn't do. How do you develop so that you have the right evidence that gets on that screen in the right way that appropriately helps the doctor say, hey, that's a good therapy because those guys did the work, ran the studies, and that's the right thing to do. So it has huge implications for everything that we do, and we're thinking a lot about how do we rethink from the ground up which trials we do, how do we do them, do we do them with the kinds of tools that Doug's talking about so that you can show, hey, it's not just the pill, it's the kind of beyond the pill, we don't make pills, we make injections, but beyond, <laughs> beyond the needle. Um, it's not just the pill, it's that you get a better outcome when you use the whole system around it, exactly. right? And so literally, if somebody else comes with the exact same molecule or are very similar in the same class, if we've done the work and we've been ahead of it, we can say it's not the same thing. That's one piece of a much larger system which is what we're offering, a solution to healthcare systems. And because of increased adherence compliance or increased patient identification mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, if you use the, competitor system, the competitor's molecule, you're gonna get result X. If you use our system, you're gonna get X plus a bunch. It's a, dip, it's a whole different thing. It's not comparable. Yeah. Yeah. So that's very valuable, but you have to do the work and you have to be forward thinking and it's, you know, it takes a while. No, I, I agree with that, Mike. I think a couple of things I wanna pick up from my side, I think. One is when you're thinking about how you think about value, what is the patient population? Right, are we talking stratified to very early disease or are we talking very severe mm -hmm. patients? Being clear in that yep. and understanding the, the, the actual relative difference and what evidence you're gonna to need to generate is gonna be very important. We, we mentioned earlier in the, in the panel, understanding the patient journey. Equally important, I wanna pick up on one of Doug's point, you need to understand the payer journey. Where, does the, where do the dollars flow for any given treatment? And who is gonna benefit from the treatment and who is actually going to be worse off because the treatment actually orders things um, and changes that incentive piece. So you need to understand that payer journey, the dollar flow, in order to work with the system 
to, to maximize that uh, are, I think, two of the key things in understanding. Because ultimately, you have to make sure that the value proposition is understandable to everybody in the system. I think the days of saying this is great value for patients, but hey, Mr. Payer, there's no value for you, is not really going to be sustainable. We have to think of the whole, the whole system. Um, a couple of it, examples from uh, Shire that we're doing in this area. One is in our hemophilia treatment, we developed what we call MyPKFit, which is an app that uses just several drug, blood drawers to develop the personalized PK profile of patients with hemophilia so they can dose themselves uh, based on what level they're attempting to achieve versus the traditional just weight-based treatment, which is, which is helpful but not clearly not as tailored and personalized as we can produce with MyPKFit. And the other one, I think it is an important one, is, is we have HiQVia where we've developed a monthly sub-Q in order for patients to be treated in the home. So again, the site of care, where we think it's appropriate, we think one, patients would prefer to be treated at home, and two, they, they're suffering from primary immune deficiency. Hospital is not the best place in the world to receive, you know, to go to when you suffer from that disease. So thinking through the journey and changing that are two examples that we've thought about that we believe help patients and help the system. Yeah, we're, we're working with a lot of um, cardiologists and you think about they want to control the care and they want the patients in the office, and they really don't. They really want to be able to spend their time in the office with the patients that have those more acute needs. Mm -hmm. And so they're becoming more and more open to assuming that the data is, is valid. Uh, having the patient um, do their own, for example, EKG or some of the things you're talking about um, remotely and have them have the ability to prioritize the data they're getting in to take the right intervention rather than just being inundated by a bunch of frequent flyers or worried wells. Yeah, you can triage the need. As yeah. you get technology, you can triage who really needs what. You got it. Yeah. And and it that's needs. a win-win. I mean, what patient wants to be a patient? No. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. <laughs> Everybody wants to be a person, not a patient. Exactly. Excellent. All right, so if, if these are the new models, what is, what is really limiting our ability to bring these forward? Uh, so. <laughs> okay, I guess we're looking at me. So I'll look at you, Mike. <laughs> we're looking at you, Mike. Um, I, I think I gestured at it a little bit before. Uh, a lot of this is, you know, you're, you're just, it, it's understanding the systems. The systems are incredibly complicated. Uh, it's very hard to understand how anything works, where the value is. So uh, partially it's just what will really help and trying to understand things enough to figure that out because you can do a lot technologically that turns out not to be very interesting. Then there is this design element we talked about, really designing things in a way that actually help the players in the system and help generate value as opposed to, again, just being sort of like a cool toy that nobody really wants to use. Um, there's the cultural clashes that I described, right, trying to get, you know, a healthcare system that really tries to, to work on a zero defect model, we, we could kill people if we make mistakes, with a high tech industry that says, you know what, you go out there, you try stuff, sure, stuff won't work, that's cool, and we'll fix it. And neither of those are wrong, but they have to be applied appropriately in the right situations. And then, of course, there's sort of the appropriate regulatory and ethical concerns. And we, we discussed this a bit at lunch, you know, and I, I think I won't speak for them, at least my view, and, and I think they share it, but they can speak to it, is sure, there, there are burdens from the regulators, et cetera. I actually don't think that's the biggest thing holding us back in any way. Uh, I think the regulators have appropriate concerns, and they're like everybody else trying to figure out how are we going to regulate this in a way that doesn't kill it, because we want digital to move quickly, we want advanced devices and those sorts of things, but at the same time, they're saying, hey, we've got to protect patients, we've got to make sure this isn't going to lead to worse outcomes, how do we, how do, we do that in a way that that is, you know, clear because as Doug alluded to earlier, there have been some examples of things that people have thrown out into the world that turned out to be okay. probably less helpful than they could have been. I'll let him say that. Um, so, you know, how do, how do we actually regulate that? And I think when you put that all in, and then there's just the sheer scale of the healthcare system. I mean, we were talking about, you know, a, a, a three trillion dollar industry or something like that in the United States alone, something it's on about that order. Twenty percent right? of our GDP. Yeah, exactly. So when you're talking about something of that scale, it takes a long time. Even if you had the next killer thing, right, yeah. that, that works really well, it takes a long time just to penetrate a system, get them to to react and rebuild what they're doing. And these are overburdened systems. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of things that go into it. Yeah, I think um, you know. I think. Um, when I started in the healthcare industry, it was like a little over 10 years or so ago, 
Um, I thought a lot of the, the, the conversation around change was a lot of lip service, to be honest. But I do think over the last like five years, a lot of the regulatory um, uh, influences have really, I think, accelerated change. Um, that's not a sweeping statement. There are certain areas, especially in, uh, in, in like meaningful use and some of the other technology um, regulations have really accelerated the adoption of technology. Mm -hmm. but, but it's also created as a byproduct, which is stalling growth uh, and change, is the, is the level of silos across the system. In any given healthcare system alone, you could have up, up to 25 or more EMR systems that are disparate, that are not communicating. So if you think about that around if data becomes such an asset to derive those insights, to lead to different actions that are more efficient and more effective, when everything's just locked up in these disparate places and nobody's really truly communicating, um, that's really stalling our ability to make progress. Yeah, I mean, we see that all the time, right? You look at something, you say, we'd like to do this, but we're going to have to do it 25 times. Yeah. Right? If we want to interact with a particular EMR system or provide a solution to a particular EMR system. So it's those kind of, that gets back to the super tanker thing, right? Yeah. It's not a small little industry where you come in and you say, oh, we'll fix a few things. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I was on the phone today with, um, uh, I won't name names, but a leading EMR system trying to figure out how do we connect into workflow two hours of me and my CEO's time, um, and we left more confused than we went into the, <laughs> the conversation. Uh, it is really, really hard. You know? So I think to me that the whole silos, even from a, from a technology yeah. perspective, are just are inhibitors. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, with Doug and Mike. I think they're, they're key issues. I think I believe the most important biomarker that is out there currently is the EMR, um, but there's the issues with that. Um, I think a bigger issue as I really dig into as I think the administration and the work they're doing to, to, to centralize EMR, I think that the code on that is being cracked. What now worries me, especially on this panel when we're talking about value, is that those EMRs currently really capture inputs. Um, they capture what test was requested, not necessarily what, what test result, why, what was I looking for on that test, what action did I take on behalf of that test and what were the outcomes of those actions. And I think as we get our arms around centralizing and making sure EMRs can talk to each other, which I think we'll get there, recognizing the challenges of the silos, if we're talking about value and what were the benefits of the intervention we made, we need to move from recording inputs for billing to, to really what were the outcomes, what were the benefits. And, and that's the biggest change that I see in terms of holding us back because I think people are talking about value, people want to deliver value, Everyone's getting behind that perspective. Well, we need to start capturing those, understanding them, and tracking them. Excellent. And, and just one last thing on that. You know, that's what makes it, technologies like the ones Doug is talking about so exciting, right? So if meaningful use and other criteria, we now have a wired system, if imperfectly, but at least now we count on that almost all doctors have an EMR because otherwise yeah. they have they face real penalties. Um, it is then. You know, and, and, and the goal is what you're talking about, John. The technologies are the solution to that. We just have to figure out how do you use them, right? You know, so we now have a real movement to patient recorded, reported outcomes and their input. So how can you use technology cleverly to make it automatic for a patient to take that? Uh, as opposed to, I'm going to write out a diary and, you know, be faithful. And no, I'm not really, because at the end of the week, I may be put in a bunch of entries which aren't quite right. And it's not, so I think that's the real excitement that I do think it, it's at least possible now. And you can imagine how it happens. We've got a lot of work to get from here to there. Yeah, no, I think it's like any change management. I think the technology is going to be a great enabler of change. Yep. But as with all change, it's, it's human nature and, and the culture we exist in that will make it more difficult. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Is there any key messages, burning messages you guys have for bio leadership and the policymakers attending this conference? So, so maybe I could kick off with a few. I think, uh, I think one is, I think the entire, and I wouldn't say it's the bio leadership, and I think it's our ecosystem. And I think our, if we recognize the burden Doug said that we're getting close to 20% of health GDP, I personally think that the investment in health is a worthwhile one. If we're not improving the health of our society and the way we live, what else would you, should you spend your money on? By the same token, we as an ecosystem need to get behind making that money more efficient. And I think it's, it's, it's changing the silo game from this is your problem payer, this is your problem drug developer, this is your problem patient to, hey, we see great breakthroughs in science, we know we can do so much better. 
it should be how do we work together instead of blame each other would be, I would say, the key thing. And I think that's across all, of, all the stakeholders. Everyone needs to take their responsible view in doing that and then becoming very concrete what it will make to happen. So if we can all get behind value, if payers want value, developers want value, for example, let's start capturing the outcomes so we can prove it. Let's get behind modernizing regulatory systems to take into account real world evidence as well as placebo controlled trials and not discount one at the expense of another. Um, I think these are really critically important changes. I, I endorse that and then I would say the other message for me is that we really, you know, if I'm thinking about bio, we need to embrace the you know, the, the, the excitement that's coming from the high tech world. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you know, the skills they bring need to be married and we need to, maybe even there's some education, right? Again, I, I come across a lot of companies and why would they? They don't understand the regulatory, the legal, the compliance, the other issues. Those are, tend to be more the barriers in some cases than the technology, right? It's one thing to make a piece of technology. It's another thing to say, we can actually deploy this. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that? So in some sense, in the, in the same spirit is kind of expanding, you know, who the suppliers of these solutions are going to be and how do we get under the same tent and say, hey, we're all trying to do the same thing here and we're facing a set of constraints and how do we help you understand the constraints and how do you help us understand the technology, et cetera. Yeah. The only thing I would add is just picking up what Mike said earlier around a reframe what your point of differentiation from the pill or the injection or the drug to the system and also reframe where in which do you play in that consumer experience. And mm -hmm. it's not reacting to a disease state, it's how do you help prevent and then manage that continuum. I think that's a, it's a, I think that's a reframe that is important. Great. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so one final question from our side and then we're gonna open it up to the floor. Um, so where do you really think we are um, in this evolution? Early. I, I mean, again, you know, it's an old saw, but you know, we tend to underestimate, we tend to overestimate how fast technology is going to change what we're doing. But at the same time, we underestimate how radical it will be when it actually arrives, right? So I think we're like, you know, in terms of, you know, cell phones, it's like 1985, right? We have no <laughs> idea. The iPhone's coming, yeah. the Android's coming, all that stuff's coming. It may be years away, and I think it is. But when we get done with this, healthcare won't look anything like it looks yeah. today. I don't think it will be, it will just be radically different in ways that are even hard to imagine. Again, imagine someone in 1985 holding one of those brick cell phones saying, someday I'm going to have a supercomputer in my pocket. I'm going to have a computer that's more powerful than any computer on Earth, and it's going to let me play games and just do all the things that, that's, we're back there with the brick. Yeah. We're mm -hmm. trying to figure out what's yeah. that solution yeah. going to be. Yeah. With a 40-minute battery. <laughs> I, I, I agree we're early. and I, The way I would characterize it is a lot of kind of point innovation happening. And I think we're a great example of a point innovator. Yep. I mean, we are not a platform. We are not, you know, an iOS uh, platform. But, I mean, there's something, there's a lot of uh, point innovation happening in certain areas. You know, there are some good examples. Amata Health is a good example of point innovation and diabetic management. Um, yep. There's some interesting other areas of, of point innovation. But I think what's exciting is the momentum we're getting. I would say, you said the word sexy. I would say we're all in the sexiest industry there is. Right now, yours is um, just frankly sexier than mine. We, we, we're slightly a little sexier, maybe X or I don't know. But no, um, I think it's so exciting to be where we are because I mean, think about it. Apple. I met with Phil Schiller, the number two guy at Apple. Health care, not fitness tracking. Health care is a key strategic priority for them. Google, key strategic priority. Facebook, all these amazing consumer-oriented. <coughs> Culture, pop culture brands that are pervasive across the globe are all trying to think about healthcare and prioritize healthcare. There's so much momentum around some of the biggest companies in tangential spaces that's putting more and more attention on the need to disrupt an antiquated model. Um, so I, I think it's like it's it's the most exciting time I think in healthcare to be leaders such as ourselves, really you know pioneering that change. It's early, but the momentum is real. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I think in terms of where we are, I agree it's early. I think the excitement of the breakthroughs in biology, which I really believe are fundamentally true, combined with digital being exactly. there at the same time yeah. is incredibly, incredibly exciting. Um, what I would add to this value and outcomes evolution is, is, is really prevention. I really think with the technologies and, and the Googles and the Apples of this world, combined with the understanding of the biology and biological progression, 
I, I think we're also on the, on the verge of a revolution in actually being able to manage prevention, um, as well as managing late stage disease. And if we can get behind that as an industry, that's going to do as much as anything to also manage the, the value and the cost burden that, that we see. So I, I think it's early, I think it's incredibly exciting, and I think building on Mike's point, I think it's going to go much faster than anyone believes. If you'd have said to me when I had my old brick phone uh, 20 years ago, you're going to have the smartphone, I would never have believed it, but it, it, it's there and it's going to happen faster and faster. And I, and I think one thing that John said that's super important to reflect on, we focus on the digital side of, of the transformation of the world, and that's huge. Uh, but I think what's less appreciated is the fact, at least I believe, and I'm a scientist by training, so I tend to go towards the molecular side even though I'm on the digital side now. Um, there is a real revolution in our understanding of biology that's happened. And it's the same kind of phenomenon. We cracked the human genome in 1999, 2000. We thought that was going to lead to drugs by 2003. It really didn't. But now in 2016, we're seeing a lot of stuff. You see what's happening in cancer. You see what's happening in heart disease. You see all these things. And you say, wow, these drugs are amazing. And they're only going to get better. So you put the, the kind of things we're talking about together with that. And I think, again, you're looking at a landscape in 10, 20, 30 years that's hard to imagine, right? I mean, at some point, maybe, you know, you don't need companies like us because people are just healthy. They just are, right? And yeah, there's little tweaks they have to get occasionally, and there's some generic companies that do stuff. Now, again, that may be 100 years from now. I don't know. But that's what we're trying to do, right? We want everybody to live a long, full, healthy life, not have to worry about illness, get to see their grandchildren, get to do everything they want to do. Um, and I think we're going to get there. And I think it's the combination of all these technological revolutions that are going to let us do it. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I, I spent a, a large chunk of my career working in neuroscience and stroke. And hearing Doug's story at, at lunchtime of preventing strokes, knowing what a devastating disease it was. And I spent a large time, big outcome trial, developed a scale to prove that it wasn't just saving people from stroke, but their quality of life after the stroke was worth preserving. Mm -hmm developed that scale, developed what I thought was a very patient-centric approach. But when you reflect back, if you could have prevented those strokes, how much more would that have been? It, was, it really made my lunchtime and my, uh, my time at bio today. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, we'd like to turn it over to you guys. Um, you've heard what these guys are, have had to say so far. What questions do you have? Mike takes all the hard ones, so I do the easy <laughs> ones. <laughs> and thus it has ever been. Certainly. I'll repeat the question if you wish. So um, I think we're seeing a lot of innovation and excitement from the manufacturing side, so whether it's the traditional manufacturers or some of the new ones in digital. Um, but some of the other players in the market, like miners and payers, are less, uh, are moving, I guess, with, with less force. Um, what attitudes are you looking for from these other kind of silo, traditionally siloed players? And how, how are you opening some of these doors and changing their mind? So, so just for those of you who may not have heard it, um, I think uh, you acknowledge the fact that the manufacturers are moving and are making these uh, types of changes. The question was really the other players in the space, the providers, the payers, and others in the, in the other silos per se. Um, you know, what, what, do, what do we need from them? What do we want from them? And what, what, what pace do you think they're changing at? Yeah, maybe, maybe I can give a, a bit perspective from my view. I think there are certain parts of the system which won't be at that point, but I do believe that our responsibility is to, is to bring them with us. So I think to work with the providers, if we think about, for example, in value risk management schemes, I think we all inherently say whatever technology we're working on, there's going to be a variance of outcome. The way to deal with that from a value perspective is to, is to put in place a risk management scheme where we share that with the payer and ourselves. However, where I feel the technological revolution is going to help, we can't introduce 40 new drugs a year with 40 different setups and schemes to capture those outcomes we're going to need people like Doug's company to, to, re, to really improve the measurement, the outcome measurement, and make sure that we can do that seamlessly across the system and not an individual drug at an individual point in time. Because people on those drugs that need those new drugs are often on five or six other drugs. So the burden of that standardization, capturing new outcomes, we're going to have to revolutionize that. But we need to work in partnership with those people. I think it's our responsibility as the innovators to help them uh, come to that journey themselves. Yeah. And I do think we have to say, at least it's not my perspective, that they're being particularly recalcitrant or slow. You know, they're, they're, they're running very large organizations, they've heard it all before, and the kind of capital investment we'd be talking about to move whole systems yeah. is gigantic. I think they're rightly saying, okay, I, I need some proof 
before I move thousands of hospital beds or you know, whole systems to something, you know, show me that it works. And that's what we're all struggling to work with them on. How do you prove it? What's the way you do it? But I could be wrong, but I believe when they see enough evidence, you know, maybe not all of them at once will jump, but some forward-thinking ones will jump. They will benefit greatly from it, and then everybody else will come along. That's sort of the story of innovation. I think you are going to actually see some of the innovations. There are innovations coming in on the payer and the provider side. I mean, we haven't spent a lot of time. I mean, if you even go back to HIMSS conference, United Healthcare and Qualcomm Life announced that mm -hmm. they were putting into place an activity-based uh, health plan. It was sort of like the equivalent of the auto insurance that knows that you have jackrabbit starts and sudden decelerations, et cetera, but it's designed to pay you to actually manage your own health and your own health care and outcome, and it actually uses a uh, proprietary wearable to do that. So they are trying to kind of integrate some of the ideas. And I think if you look at certain systems, you'd find some, like an intermount and others, highly analytic, using a lot of the health data, a lot of health information, and some of the patterns that you heard described here. They're trying to build that into their infrastructure. But to Mike's point, you know, modernizing even an EMR system is a billion to a billion but and a half dollar investment. But it's investment. interesting, like you point, sometimes it is going to be. You know, Intermountain is a very forward-looking system, but it's a smaller system, right? Yeah. It doesn't cover the entire country. Exactly. And have to say, oh, well, we'll do this and we'll try to move, you know, 50 million lives at once. What if we're wrong? Right. right, right. I mean, so I, I just think you have to be That's realistic about the, the way that this will evolve. Mm -hmm. but, but, but my experience with the many of these companies, that they want to be innovative. They want to do better for their patients. Absolutely. And I think Absolutely. with with that momentum, we can we can help each other do it. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we've also seen, you know, providers we've worked with, or hospital systems we've worked with, even in Europe, where they're hooking up with med device companies, and the med device companies are taking responsibility for the patient post uh, treatment for particularly in cardiovascular. So they're basically getting, the bed device company is getting paid per patient per month to keep the, the patients out of the hospital system and basically provide the care necessary in their home environments in order to, to reduce the readmission rates. So that kind of partnership we're seeing evol evolving quite quickly actually at the moment. So hopefully it'll actually go in the right direction. We've had a very patient lady here. Yeah, Go ahead. thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. You know, like uh, we, we talk a lot about the, the, the trend here domestically and, and in, in domestic market. Uh, but, you know, as the data says, you know, 95% of the population lives outside of the United States. So, uh, you know, like the, the cool um, uh, app that, you know, Doug's company de develops, you know, like, or, you know, any other cool, uh, cool stuff that, you know, those two big companies will, will, will be, you know, developing. Uh, my question is, you know, do you see that going overseas? And what, what is, what are the barriers if, if you know, uh, for the export strategy? And, and you know, um, and what are the opportunities there as well? I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Okay. Trying to paraphrase that question? I think, I think Jeff already. What, go ahead. So my quick paraphrasing is, so we've talked about a lot of innovations kind of here, US. but if we think about but there's a number of other health systems that are actually going through and doing capacity building, evolving and changing. If we took a non, an ex-US kind of lens, mm -hmm. where, are we, where and how, and you should correct me if I'm not capturing this right, but where and how and what kinds of things are we going to see there? Or when will, would they be more beneficiaries? Uh, yeah. respectively. Certainly having, having done some work in, around different parts of the globe, I see some parts of the world are going to be very similar to the US. So for example, you know, the, Europe I think will have some, many of the same infrastructure challenges to change um, and some of the same investments. They will have some things that will be slightly easier with single payer decisions. Exactly. Um, but I think most excitingly for me, and I've had meetings in two examples recently in Indonesia and South Africa is are the abilities for some of these healthcare systems to actually leap straight to some of these newer elements. Exactly. Not all, all their people have cell phones already. It's not like yeah. they don't have smartphones. Exactly. It's not like yeah. they, they're the same thing leaping the single line, you know, the landline straight to the cell phones potentially. Yeah. So I agreed 100%. Yeah, that, that's going to be the most exciting. Why, why would I build all this infrastructure? Why wouldn't I start off with an outcomes-based EMR? Other things that people can do, people are going straight there and they're, they're using the much more scalable digital technology to get there than traditional bricks and mortar. Yeah, yeah I think even if you look um, in China and look at the trend in the last number of years on 
the buying up of patient-oriented solutions, apps, capabilities. It's all been, you know, the Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent have literally bought up all of these good doctor applications, things that have been around for 10, 15 years, but they're buying up the ecosystem because they believe that that's yeah. where they can add value uh, going forward uh, to, the, to, the, to linking up different elements of the system. And they won't have the infrastructure that we have. No, the, uh, you know, from my mind, they'll have totally, even totally different drug and treatment distribution models. And we'll see it much more dis... I think we'll see it much more disruptive in some of those countries, ex-US than the US, because yeah. people won't face the same regulatory or historical thinking and silos that Doug talked about. They'll just say, hang on, this makes so much sense to get this delivered in this fashion against this, this technology. And, and I think you'll see some much more forward-looking leaps much faster in some of those countries. Well, and John, I think you actually said something, you know, you talked about a single payer, or at least something that could function a little bit like that. And there are initiatives like the Singapore government has indicated that they want to eradicate or make a major dent in diabetes. And they sort of sit here and say they now have health care for life, sort of a guaranteed lifetime kind of reimbursement plan combined with a 100% EMR coverage and digital coverage. But they're actually seeing these chronic diseases actually increase, which then, as we talked about before, have high comorbidities with heart failure, et cetera. So they're sitting here and kind of saying, we can deploy some fairly novel solutions that will actually involve patient self-management involvement of their own health and, and health care in, in differentiated ways. So I do think, actually, you are going to begin to kind of see some of these rolling out, particularly as they sort of say they don't want to build the type of capacity we have. They'd actually want to avoid the types of indications that require that capacity. Yeah. No, I think, I think Singapore is one of the most forward-looking places no on the planet with health. I think you've got not just the insurance scheme, but the health savings scheme. Right. Exactly. I think you've got a chief medical officer in John Kim who's very, very forward-looking. Yeah. And, and people that have the saving and the insurance right. recognize the value of that prevention in that, in that totally society. Right. Yeah, and in but, those single-payer systems in that way, they, do, they can really think long-term, right? Yeah. You know, something that pays off in 20 or 30 years, fine. In the U.S., although the incentives are getting better and more value-based, it's a little harder if things don't pay off for 15 years, mm -hmm. right? So. You know, look, there's puts and takes, but I think the rest of the world will lead in some places and lag in others. And but but it's not a U.S. story. Right? Yeah. Any stretch no. of imagination. Definitely. We hope that answers your question. Great. Or at Thank least you. a perspective. If we don't want to, <laughs> just a perspective. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we have one more question here. Thank you guys for the wonderful thoughts today. Uh, this week's been a lot about patient-centric and patient-focused, and we talked about different ecosystem players being critical to come together to solve some of these systems level challenges. How do we think about the other side of that doctor-patient relationship, the physician? We talked provider systems, but what's the speed that you talked about that we saw cell phones go from bricks to smartphones in our hand? What's the role of the physician in that entire process moving forward? What can we expect that to look like? What's the future for the physician in this world? And what's their role in helping shepherd or be a part of some of this change? Thank you. I guess I'll take that one because we talked about this at lunch and I mm -hmm. made an impassioned uh, plea about the role of the physician. You know, I still at least personally believe that the learned intermediaries, we call them, will be important for as far as I can see, even in that far future when we have all this stuff because, you know, it's a human business, health is a very personal matter. Uh, but I do think over time these tools not only, again, help the patients, they're going to have to help the physician. Because the physician, there's so much medical information that's exploding so fast, we cannot reasonably expect the physician to know everything. And we can't expect them to spend hours a day looking at websites trying to bone up on stuff. No. We're going to have to have systems that provide them the exact information they need to make the appropriate decision with judgment and experience at the exact right time that they need it in their workflow as they go through their day. Yeah. Right? And this gets back to something that you said, Doug, which is we haven't had point solutions. Right? But as we put those together, I think what you're going to see is there's going to be a whole system behind the physician um, that's going to support them in making those decisions. I personally believe we will, for as far as I can see, still have sort of a sacred relationship between the doctor and the patient, and the physician will still be at the center of that. Yeah. Uh, from, their, from the healthcare system side, I think patients are going to want to have a person that has spent a lot of time understanding this, is truly an expert that they can talk to as a human being. But I think there's going to be a whole web of technologies 
tools, systems, maybe invisibly going in the background that are going to support that. And that's what I meant a little bit at the beginning about the design thinking. It's not just what happens around the patient, it's what happens around the physician, yeah. what it looks like from the system point of view, from a hospital administrator or something like that, from a payer. You got to get the whole thing right because if there's any break in the chain, and I think you mentioned it, John, it won't be taken up, no. yeah. right? People just won't do it. I think there's, there's been some, there's some headlines out there that you know a large percentage of the, what the physician does will go away and machines will do it. I don't think that's true. I think our orientation from a company's perspective is just what, what, what Mike said, just how, do, how can we make the physician a better physician? And then think about like self-driving cars, like you, know, you, you got one. Um, it's an autopilot. And it could do a better job. I think the accident rate is 50% better than humans right. in the sense that there's all these different data points that, the, that computers and analytics can process in a second that the human would never be able to do. Same thing as a physician. In our company, we use machine learning. There are things that we have learned about EKGs mm -hmm. that over the last over 100 years in which EKGs have been a tool of physician, they've never known. Yeah. I think that's actually a really good question because if you think about you know, if the more routine and mundane things actually that should, in work. fact, we should keep people away from facilities because they only, as you go up and think about decision support and the complexity and bringing it to bear and almost creating the cockpit for that expert, yep. you may find they're taking on higher value, exactly. more complicated, yeah. but that, with better tools. You want that exactly. physician look at yeah. the patient as a whole and say, I have all this data, I have That's all this right. stuff. Yeah. There's also a patient in front of me who's Absolutely. maybe going through a personal crisis in their life and has all these other things. And I understand that, by the way, I've seen a thousand patients like this, he just doesn't look right, or she yeah. doesn't look right to me, and all the data, so I'm gonna do right. some stuff to make sure we understand this patient. Where this next patient, the data looks the same, I'm gonna do something slightly different, tailor them, because I understand them as a person. Yeah. I think you need both, right? Yeah. That's the key. If, yeah. you, if you drop one or the other, we're not gonna get the outcome. Mike, uh, I, I think, I'm sorry, sorry. No, I think, I think the point, the, revol the real revolution of the physician, I think build on Doug and Mike's point, is gonna be the information that's available at the point of care. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I think that point of care is gonna enable the physician to triage that patient. And the Doug's point on machine learning is gonna, the speed of change and development, even an expert in the field is only gonna be able to focus on a very narrow piece. But with the revolution in, in diagnosis and liquid biopsies and a whole host of assessment monitors, they're gonna be able to turn all that information, machine learning, and then really help patients. But that at the point of care is what's going to be the real revolution and I think will add a huge amount of value to the system because it will be delivered in a technological way through point of care versus going through multiple departments, multiple silos, multiple different groups running different pieces. The cleaning that up using the technology that Doug's talked about is, is going to be one of the major revolutions that will help reduce the cost of the system while improving care. And maybe just to bring a couple of what I heard in your earlier comments where you were describing the types of investments and capabilities that you're developing internally, that area sounds like an area of very close collaboration, interaction, and maybe the basis of the relationship with a lot of these provider systems and yep. physicians Absolutely. Kind of going forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, do we have any further questions? If yeah, we have one, well, one more. I'm not sure if everybody got the question, but the point was made that 20 years ago, we did not perceive the convergence that actually happened when the internet evolved and we had then the convergence of the hardware and the software, and then somebody put a, a, a camera on top of it and completely changed our lives, basically. Um, simple stuff that existed but converged. 
I think your point is that you would like this panel to comment on the convergence of the future of healthcare and what will be those true disruptors and what will that world look like? I, I, look, I don't think we ball. know, but I do say, look, you have remote sensing capabilities, you have new molecular sensing capabilities, liquid biopsying that was mentioned, you have the kinds of technologies Doug talking about, which is a version of remote sensing, you have big data and the ability to analyze it, not just machine learning, but all the other associated techniques. Exactly how that all comes together. And then you have the molecular revolution that I spoke about. Um, Honestly, I, I, I'm not smart enough to tell you what the end game is. I think our strategy is we need to be plugging away at it. We need to be working with lots of partners. We need to try to be out there and see how it goes because I'm not sure what the eventual solution is. I'm just sure it's going to be pretty crazy and radical for exactly the reasons you said and probably not exactly what I'm imagining today. Yeah. But if we try a bunch of stuff, you know, we're going to get some amazing results, right? Right now we're getting sort of good results, but I think we'll get truly revolutionary results. I don't know how it's going to go. No, Maybe these guys uh, are. No, John's I'm, much smarter than me, so you probably know. This, you know? <laughs> no, I'm definitely not much smarter. What, the, the only reason I'm, I'm a bit smarter than Mike is I know I don't know. Right? <laughs> and, and no matter how much I think about it, no matter how many people I meet with, no matter how many Google Labs I go to, I know I don't know. What I do know is that there's been a, a democratization of science in terms of entrepreneurial science and entrepreneurial biology. And I think there's been a democratization of technology with the ability to demonstrate you know, the writing of software and apps and really the much more affordability to get into the hardware as well. So I think those three elements together mean that people that are far, far smarter than me are gonna come up with things I can't even imagine. And the key for people in this room is to make sure we're at least keeping an eye on and we see the camera being developed, if you will, rather than the camera landing on the desk and saying, ha ha, you didn't think about that, did you? I would say, I pick up on your term of point of care. I think the term of point of care is going to get blown away. Or blown away. I think uh, what we're focusing on as a company is we don't want you to be in the ER. We don't want you to be in the doctor's office. And we know there are symptoms in advance of a heart attack that if you took action on, you'll be alive. And our, our challenge and our mission as a company is to save lives by using these modern technology and tools to unearth those, those symptoms early and motivate you as a human to take the necessary action to avoid that heart attack, that ER visit, that point of care. And your life happens outside those doctors', doctors you know, points of care. And so that's, that's what we're focused on. Um, and so that's where I think things are going, that just our orientation. Mm -hmm. So the other thing I'd add is just a vector that points in direction, that if you talk to a large risk-bearing provider systems that have moved more towards population, you could look at some of the ones in Scandinavian countries, the first thing they want to do is they actually wish they had less acute capacity and they actually want to push mm -hmm. yes. all this out. So, you know, things that we thought were kind of consumer instruments, which, you know, kind of now become medical grade and have the same precision, and actually it's happened a lot faster than most people want. So if there's themes, part of the themes, particularly as we kind of increasingly move our reforms and other stuff is, all the incentives are gonna be able to use that infrastructure, those remote sensors, and other things, as quickly and productively as possible, and we can't assume just because it looks like it's consumer that it doesn't become yeah. kind of, you know, medical press of precision of everything out there, and that will probably happen to your point about speed, may happen a little bit faster than we might otherwise yeah, more predict. Agreed. Uh, yeah, I, I just add one more thing. You know, the reason the camera went on there at the end was that somebody actually thought about how we live our lives and what we do every day and what we might like to do with it. Yeah. And I think the fundamental shift that truly needs to happen, and I know a lot of people end up cynical about it, is really looking at how a person, not a patient, but a person lives their lives and how they can, through living their lives, either prevent disease or live with it. And then what do you have to do to help them to do that? The rest is just icing on the cake. And that's where the system will move to. And that's where we all have to change our thinking. We were fixing problems in the past. We weren't actually preventing them from ever happening. And the economics of the matter are that we fundamentally have to shift our thinking that way. Well, we're Guys, all, we're out of time. Yeah, we're all zeros and have a red <laughs> flashing light up here, so thank you very, very much thank for the panel. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much.